Good afternoon and welcome back. We know we're among great teachers because when you eat lunch and nobody really talks about anything but school, uh, you know you're dealing with fanatics, so it feels comfortable be to be with you all. I wish uh, Congressman Kandrowski was still here, though, to give us some inside story on Mr. Gingrich getting neutered. <laughs> but he's gone. Our presenter for the first session this afternoon is a Pennsylvanian. He graduated from St. Vincent's College out in the western part of the state uh, maybe two or three years ago. He is then the principal of the Graham Parks Alternative Public School in Cambridge, Massachusetts, been there since 1981. There are 400 or so students in his school, very diverse population. The school has been identified as excellent by a number of groups. It's a Holmes Group School. Those of you who are in Foundations of Education uh, should ring some bells on that one. It's a Carnegie Group demonstration site. And sometimes we pay attention to our own literature, but every once in a while when you step out of the professional literature and look at what real people read, we discover that various magazines and journals tell us some things that we would like to know. For example, the Graham Park School has been identified as an outstanding school by Red Book Magazine, which is a, which is a, a group that pays an awful lot of attention to what's good for kids. So I present to you Dr. Lynn Solo. Uh, thank you. It's uh, interesting to be back in Pennsylvania. Uh, I grew up in southwestern Pennsylvania in uh, coal mining country. Uh, my father was a coal miner. Um, and I see a lot of similarities between uh, this area and the area I grew up in. Um, long ago, though, I left uh, Pennsylvania and have been moving around. And now, actually, I've been in Massachusetts, in Boston, since 1974 as principal of the alternative school. And I'm going to be talking this afternoon about my school. And uh, this is my school, literally. Uh, it's from a cover of a book uh, that's a, uh, an early reader uh, that a company did. Uh, they did a several uh, books in a series. And this is about my school. And this is my school. Can people tell me what they see here? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Okay, you see that uh, children are in a classroom and they're in cooperative learning groups in that classroom. What do you mean that it's integrated? Uh, it's a whole group of different cultures. Um, absolutely true. One of the great things about Cambridge is that it has incredible diversity. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, all of us know that the, the real starting point for learning is, is kids. But the best starting point for kids, or, or for a school, is heterogeneity, wide diversity of children. Because when you bring diversity together and you allow it to interact and mix, then the learning is richer. And indeed, it is uh, uh, a multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-social class school. Anybody see anything, Anybody see anything else? Resource rich, what's that mean? Learning starts from the concrete. Kids have to experience. Then you move toward representational and abstraction. But you learn, you do. It's not from a textbook necessarily. We do use textbooks occasionally, but it's active involvement in the environment. Um, I, actually, I don't remember anymore. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I think they all were doing some sort of reading activity, but there were a variety of reading activities going on at the same time. Uh, it's a mixed age group of first and second graders, by the way. Uh, all of our classes in the school are mixed age group groups. Kindergarten, first and second, third and fourth, fifth and sixth, seven and eight. We are a K through eight school. We pay attention to structure a great deal. We try to think about structures that help to lead towards success. And we think that a really important structure is the multi-gradedness. And we think that that's an important structure in the school. I'm going to try to switch back and forth between various media. Uh, this is the Graham and Parks Alternative Public School. It's a citywide school of choice. A citywide school of choice. We were founded in 1972 by a group of parents. Okay? Lots of important ideas right here. In 1981, the whole city went to choice. We have 15 elementary schools, and all the schools are schools of choice now. That means that you don't go to your neighborhood school, you go to the school of your choice. Does anybody know what that could mean? Competition. What's that mean? Then what do you do? Uh, you can. Um, what that means in Cambridge is we have now developed since 1981 a variety of kinds of schools. Um, we have what's called uh, what we call an open classroom school. It's now referred to in the literature in all kinds of different ways, uh, developmental, constructivist, uh, Piaget and Dewey. Uh, that's where we lean. That's the kind of philosophy, that's the kind of beliefs that we have. But there's an A.D. Hirsch school in the district. Uh, there's a more even fundamentalist back to basic school, two-way bilingual programs in Portuguese and Spanish, where half the children are from the from that cultural or ethnic background, the other half are not, and they all learn two languages together. Uh, we have a variety of schools, and people indeed have choices. When you have a child and you want to come to school in Cambridge, you go to the Parent Information Center, and you learn that you have to go visit schools as a parent. And we as schools know that we have to host prospective parents. And they come to visit and they window shop. Indeed, they do window shop. They come and look. I sit with every group that comes into the school. We have visitors twice a week for the first semester. And I sit with them and I talk about the school. I talk about the children. I talk about the parents. They ask lots of questions. They bring notebooks because they go visit other schools too. We have a waiting list. We're an attractive school. We're an attractive school because we work hard at it and we succeed. Cambridge is not a large school district. We have between seven and 8,000 students. We have 15 elementary schools and one comprehensive high school that was designed in a way that you mentioned. Uh, it's broken down into houses, uh, alternative programs. There are probably about seven or eight uh, diverse programs in the high school, and you can choose to go into either or all of, uh, uh, whichever one you want to choose into. Okay, um, could you go with one more slide? 
Our school, this is a uh, huge mural, mural on the front wall. Our school is named after two people. Rosa Parks, who uh, has visited the school a number of times, and Sondra Graham. Uh, Sondra Graham is a local activist, a local politician. I think you can see immediately where our values lie. Uh, we deliberately chose those two people as our ideals. Um, the Graham and Parks piece of the name happened about 10 years into the school. Uh, we started as the Cambridge Alternative Public School, which was a small 200 student school. By the way, another really key structure is the size of the school. Um, uh, uh, anybody who's worked in a small school knows that they can work so much better than a big school. You can create community, you can create family, you can really personalize education. Uh, I had, a, I had visitors uh, last week from Chicago. There's a whole movement now in Chicago toward small schools. As a matter of fact, that's what it's called, the small schools movement in Chicago. As you know, Chicago has completely decentralized their school system. They basically gave up on the large school system because they couldn't systemically make it work. But now they're trying to make it work by giving the power where it belongs, and that is at the local sites. And asking each of the local sites to develop their programs along with their staff and their parents. I want to go over a little bit, of, a little bit more facts about the school. I kind of give you a uh, sense of who we are. Again, it's a K through eight school. Uh, we think that's an, that's an important structure. Uh, as a matter of fact, and I know I'll get into arguments with people, the only unique thing about American education is middle school, and I think that's a failure. I think that's a big mistake. When you put 400, 500, 600 twitchy bodies together at that age, I think you're asking for trouble. You're asking for huge trouble. But when you put seventh and eighth graders, maybe about 80 of them, into a K-8 school, and you connect them, and you keep them connected with the lower grades, then you get things like, I don't have a drug problem in the school. This is a city school. None of my kids are into alcohol. There's never been a pregnancy. The attendance rate is about 97%. That's the difference. <clears throat> we admit by lottery within the categories of race right now. In the 70s and soon into the future, we're gonna go back to what we did and admit by gender and social class. That's the taboo word or words in American education but it's the key in American education. You go to any middle class or upper middle class district and the children are succeeding. You go to poor districts and they're probably not. Social class is the, I think, the most important issue in American education, especially in urban education. What we try to do is to even the playing field because in Cambridge, we did not lose the middle class in our city. So we have categories for social class. It's clear to us that you need a slight predominance of middle class to set a tone in the school. And we also see that when we do that, that we have a better shot at having the working class students rise in a sense, with a rising tide. So for us, it's really important to think about who comes to the school. That we do have a mixture so that children experience the whole range, of, in a sense, of what life is and who is in the world. And so 
We balance it racially, we balance it by gender, and we balance by social class. Uh, I won't go into it very far, but we don't use income as a determining factor. We use education in the family and or job status as the determining factor for social class. Okay, our structure, self-contained, multi-graded, open classrooms. That picture that I showed you, showed you that open classrooms. At the seventh and eighth grade level, we have what I'd call a flexible program. Um, it's a kind of a bridge between the lower school and high school. And, and we think of it in some ways as a bridge. Um, in, in a self-contained classroom, you have that sort of closeness between the teacher and the student and they get to know each other a great deal and very well. At the high school level, you have usually subject-oriented moving from class to class. What we try to do is to incorporate both of those things in the middle school program. Some of the ways that we do that, uh, for example, we don't have English and social studies or language arts and social studies. We have humanities. And that brings those two subjects together, but what it also does is have a longer period each day. So that when you're studying humanities, you're there for two blocks, two periods a day, and once a week you're there for three blocks because we do portfolios uh, uh, during that third block. Uh, kids work on their portfolios and they have portfolios in all subject matter areas. Uh, we also use portfolios um, as goal setting devices. Uh, students set goals at the beginning of the year. About every month and a half they revo review their goals and it's done through the portfolio system. At the end of eighth grade, um, you have to demonstrate competency through your portfolio, which means that you as a student are responsible for pulling out some of your best stuff. Uh, you have a meeting with your parents, with uh, one of us administrators, with a teacher, and two people who are not a part of the school. And it's your responsibility to demonstrate to us that you've learned. Quite interesting to see students take charge of that. And <coughs> it's incredible the maturity that we've been able to see in students as they tell us what they've learned and to demonstrate to us what they've learned in math or science or writing or reading. School size is really important. 370 students. It's an important structure. Actually, the school was too big. It really, um, some of the good research that was done on school size was done really way back in the 50s and 60s. Um, and it's pretty clear to most of us who think about size that about 250 is, a, is about the ideal size for a school. That if they get bigger, then you really lose the personalization uh, that can occur the interaction that occur can occur. And I think it'll, you'll better understand this as I go through the afternoon, uh, especially when you're involving a lot of other people than just the teachers in your school and the children in your school. When you're involving parents and you're involving community in the teaching and learning in the school, to have all of those personal relationships occur, you've really got to have a small place. 58% of our kids are of color. We have a Haitian bilingual program in our school. Uh, that's a really large issue in many city schools and in other places in the country, how to deal with uh, immigrant groups, people who have another language. 42% of our kids are white, half, half and half males and females, and the middle class and working class br breakdown. Uh, we have about 30% of our kids on special ed plans. Does that seem high to you? Does that seem high to people? Why? Why does that seem high? 
Why? Because people tell you you should have only about 10 percent, that that's about the average in the country, or it's 15 percent. The average in Cambridge is 25. The average in Cambridge is 25. We're a little bit above the average. We have no self-contained classrooms. All the kids are integrated into the multi-graded classrooms. We do provide special services for children, both in the classroom and on a pull-out basis, uh, depending on the child. We don't think of people as separately gifted. Uh, we have kids who are incredibly um, good academically. We have kids who are incredibly weak academically. We provide for them. Uh, uh, one of the mistakes that I think happened in alternative education was that it became synonymous with special populations. And I think schools should really have, should really be a mirror of their communities. And that to separate off students is in some ways not a good thing, certainly is not democratic. We have a high level of parent involvement in the school. It's a really key important structure for us. School principals will tell us, well, we invite parents, but they don't come. You have to do more than invite parents. You have to structure for it. That means that your teachers have to have an uh, attitude that parents are good, parents are smart, parents know things, parents can do things, they're sensitive. That means that they can come into the classroom and when you have a reading group or actually when you have seven reading groups, we need help. Parents can read with kids. Parents can take kids to, to the computer labs and work with kids. They're welcome into the school. Teachers structure their days so that they can have parents come into the classroom. We structure other places in the school. Of course, everybody knows you, you want parents helping in the library, helping on field trips, bake sales. How about money? We never have enough money in schools. We have a fundraising committee. Actually, we set up a independent foundation called the Friends of Grayman Parks. And that group raises money for the school. Each year we raise about $25,000 in a city school. We do everything. We, you know, we have the bake sales. We sell the Christmas trees. We solicit directly. We have a big fair. Uh, I'm auctioned off. I babysit. Uh, that brought $125 last year. Um, we have parents involved in decision making. We have what's called a steering committee and it's made up of five elected parents, five elected staff, me, and two community people who are chosen by us. And we make the decisions in the school. I have one vote. If I'm not persuasive, it doesn't happen. That steering committee has created a whole bunch of other committees so that we can involve more people and, and uh, a larger number of people in decision making. Uh, parents are involved with hiring. Um, we set up whenever we have a position open, it's advertised internally in the district, it's advertised externally. We receive resumes, we interview those whom we think might be appropriate, and then we recommend one candidate to the superintendent for appointment. 
next to students, the staff are the most important piece of your school. And it's an incredibly difficult job to choose staff and to choose them right for your program. I think we've all experienced that if a person isn't right for the program, it's really, really difficult. We try to involve parents in lots of other ways. Um, we do things like when you come in in the morning in the first and second grade classrooms, the first thing that a kid does is take out the book that he or she is reading. We ask parents to come in and read with that child. In the morning, you go into any of the first and second grade classrooms, and there are at least a half dozen, if not more, parents reading with their kids. How can that be? Don't they work? Sure. Ninety-some percent of our parents work. But they find the time. They're able to negotiate with their employers. So they come in and read with their kids. Parents have set up what we call a book bag. Every child in kindergarten through second grade gets three books in a bag each week. And they're sent home to read with the family. And we ask the family to read with the children. Mother, father, uncle, aunt, older sibling, neighbor. We teach people who can't, don't understand how to sit and read with their children. We'll teach them how to do that. We have workshops about that. Parent involvement can do things like In the late 80s, I was getting really worn out uh, from working incredibly incredible long hours. I asked the superintendent if I could have an assistant principal. She said, no, you're too small of a school. You can't, it's impossible. So I went back to the parent body and I said, either, we're a, either we get a assistant principal or I think I'm going to have to leave. So, unbeknownst to me, they organized, set up a meeting with the school committee. Several hundred people went to a school committee meeting one night, asked the school committee for an assistant principal. 7-0 vote. Whenever issues come to the school board, to the school committee, that pertain to us and or are good for the school system, we are there politically. We call school committee members, we go to their houses, we come out in large numbers. It's a responsive school committee. They listen to their clientele. They listen to the kids, they listen to the parents. And we think that that's really important. If a school system is underfunded, but you know that the city has the funds, you push them. And you do that with parents because that's where the political power lies. It doesn't lie with a principal. It doesn't lie with the staff. It's with the parents. And you see, when you get parents involved in that kind of way, their kids know that they're really concerned about them and their learning. And that carries over to the kids. And I think it really does improve the learning in the school. It certainly improves the resources. I mean, we couldn't run our seventh and eighth grade elective program without our parents because they built and they run the pottery room, they run the photography room, they run the woodworking room. They bring these kind of resources, but they also bring themselves and their intelligence and their influence. I uh, want to talk about a few other things, and th then I'm going to do a video, and I hope, it, hope that the video works, because I want to interrupt it. Um, uh, it's what I call bits and pieces. <laughs> uh, it, it just shows bits and pieces of the school, uh, and uh, I'd like to then sort of go talk about it uh, as we go along in the film. But let me uh, talk about a couple of other things first.
having a bilingual program is an incredible experience in a school. Our kids come from Haiti, where right now most of them are incredibly poor children, financially poor, emotionally shaken, many experiencing violence. Coming from the countryside, many kids come with minimal Creole, meaning that they have limited vocabulary in their native language. We get at least one child each year who has no language, has no language. Often the students are living in different family arrangements when they come to this country. One third of our kids are Haitian bilingual students. And we have incorporated that into the school. It's been really hard trying to figure that out over the years. Uh, where we are now is we have bilingual rooms and we have monolingual classrooms. But we're integrating and integrating between those two. For example, at the kindergarten level, by the way, we're also multi-graded in kindergarten. Students in Cambridge come to school at age four and a half for a full day kindergarten. If they come at four and a half, they stay for two years in kindergarten and then go on to first grade at age six. Um, I used to like it better uh, back in the 70s. We used to be like English schools. You come to school on your birthday. So that means that kids came you know, at various times during the year. We also went for a couple of years um, having kindergarten for the first half. We had combination K-1 classrooms. And the kindergartners would start off half a day. That gave you really good focus with your first graders at the second half of the day to really focus on reading. As the kids got older in kindergarten through the year, then we would judge their maturity, they're able to handle a harder curriculum and to handle the physical day, they would stay on. And so they, in a sense, they grew into the K-1 classroom. It made a lot of sense developmentally, but we can't do that anymore because too many people have to work. And as you know, the basic function of a school is custodial care. Um, and certainly you have to do that. Um, it, it is, I mean, uh, it's just a fact of life that People have to work and they need a place for their children. Um, so what we're doing now in the Haitian bilingual program is that we're trying to integrate it totally. And what we're doing is sort of a brother and sister uh, uh, pairing of a classroom at each level in the school. So there's a paired kindergarten class, a paired one and two, paired three, four, paired five, six. And then we're doing integration activities in the 7-8. That means that whenever you have reading group, it'll be a mixed group of monolingual and bilingual children. There are separate times during the day for instruction in Creole until the children really do acquire complete English. It's an experiment that we're trying, and it seems to be working because, indeed, it's the most difficult population that we have in our school and probably uh, the most difficult population that anybody will find anywhere. Okay, I think what I'm gonna do now is to move to the video. And um, I hope I can stop and start. Uh, before we start it, I'll, I'll, um, uh, I'll try to set the stage for the first one. <clears throat> um, I have about seven different uh, pieces. And over the years, there have been a number of uh, organizations that have done films on the school. Uh, and we've done some little pieces here and there also. Uh, the first clip is from a film called uh, Why Do These Kids Love School? Uh, it was done by, uh, what's her name, Dorothy Friedman. Um, uh, it, it was focused on a particular private alternative school in California, and then the latter part of the film, uh, Dorothy went around the country filming public alternative schools. And we have just a little segment in that film, 
and it's of a seventh and eighth grade algebra class. The Coalition of Essential Schools, one of the ideas that we stole from them is that you work backwards in terms of curriculum. Where do you want your kids to learn? Where do you want them to be at the end of your school? Well, clearly, we wanted our kids to be at having learned algebra, because algebra is a key. If you have algebra in the eighth grade, and I'm talking about all children learning algebra by the end of eighth grade, including the Haitian bilingual children, and successfully doing so. Algebra is a key, because then you go on to Algebra 2, you go on to geometry, and by 12th grade, especially for anybody who's going into science and math, you've gotten to what? What's the, what's the last course? Calculus. Calculus, okay. So, this is just a brief view of a 7th and 8th grade class. It was while we were still using the University of Chicago uh, math program at the 7th and 8th grade level. We've now switched to IMP, which is a two-year algebra course taught in the 7th and 8th grade. We had 7th grade was pre-algebra, 8th grade was algebra. Think about if you want all of your kids to be able to pass algebra at eighth grade, what do you have to do between K and six? That means that you have to think about your whole math program and what you're doing and how you're doing it. Okay, just show the clip. challenge them to really think and I pose these questions which I know they could solve in the class time I just thought of a problem suppose I have the five red okay and now I want a P now I want GG okay okay I got a G I always tell students it's not a recipe I'm not teaching you pi r squared like a recipe I want them to develop these formulas. I never teach mathematical formulas. I never say, what's the formula for the area of a circle? I say, how did we get the circle? I have a thousand socks in the drawer, okay? And they're all the same color, okay? I have one color, all right? I think anyone could understand math if presented in the proper way, and there's more than one way. I need six socks. Songs. You really got to be somewhat creative about it. I think you really have to close your textbook and teach. Okay. Uh, a couple of things. There's a citywide algebra test at the end of eighth grade, and that determines what course you take in high school. It's a rare instance that any of our kids fail that test. Most of them pass in the range of 85% or better. Everybody. Everybody. That means that the child whose parents teach at Harvard and the child of the parents who clean up in the motels. And we have that range of kids. You know, Abby Rockefeller's child just graduated a couple of years ago. In other words, we have that range from the very rich to the most poor that you can find in the country. They all pass algebra because they have to succeed in the world. Okay, the next piece is um, a, a bit that CNN did 
I, I need to tell you a little bit about the background. Um, you're going to see a fifth and sixth grade class. Uh, back in the middle 70s, we started working with Seymour Papert and uh, Gene Bamberger at MIT in the Artificial Intelligence Lab. And we began working with computers, and we began working with Piaget's people from uh, Switzerland because Jean Bamberger, who is a, actually she's in charge of the music department at MIT, but she's really been interested in how kids learn sounds. And we began working with Piaget's people to think about how children learn. And it's an, it's an incredible adventure to begin designing in a sense, experiments to see how each kid learns and where his or her strengths are. And this led us to developing what we call the design lab. It's a kind of an extension of the classroom because similar activities happen in the classroom, but it's also a specialized place where we do experiments. We ask kids to design things. Uh, Gene, Berger, Gene, Gene Bamberger talks about kids having smart hands, in, in addition to being smart about manipulating symbols, whether they're math or, uh, or, or letters. There, there are some kids who have great difficulty with manipulating symbols, but yet they're incredibly smart. And, and when we find that out, then it helps us to figure out how we can work with that child, how we can adopt our style to that particular child's style. So you're going to see a shot of a fifth and sixth grade class in the design lab. Same video. Welcome to Future Watch. I'm Susan Rook, sitting in for Marianne Laughlin. It is a classroom the likes of which you have never seen before, but could be seen quite a bit of within the next two decades. What's taking place in one Massachusetts elementary school may affect the way children learn and teachers teach in the 21st century. In Cambridge, in an unconventional classroom called a design lab, Educators are looking for new ways to cut through the intellectual barrier that sometimes separates things and ideas. The Design Lab's aim is to help youngsters think in ways that will make learning easier in a regular classroom. David George has more in this week's Future File. A book for me is a book for the future. A book for the future is a book for you. Optimism resounds in the after-school rap at Graham and Park School outside Boston. At a time when some big city teachers disparagingly describe teaching as tilting at windmills, students here learn full tilt by building windmills. Yeah, turn it, turn it uh, this way. We were doing some readings in science on, on windmills and wind-powered uh, machines. And uh, uh, I asked the kids to uh, choose a medium, whether it be uh, the paper cups and the, and the straws or the Lego or the or the, uh, logo of the computer language or uh, we had an animation machine going too. And I asked them to, within that medium, create their idea of a windmill. Building things gives youngsters good with their hands a chance to shine. But MIT researcher Gene Bamberger says they're the youngsters who often have trouble with reading and math and other subjects involving symbolic expression. So it occurred to me that there ought to be a way of helping kids to make use of the smarts that they've got to help them with the kinds of things they couldn't do or they were having trouble with. I, I think so. I'm not sure. In the Graham and Park School Design Lab, students conjure up windmills with everything from pencil and paper. It actually How are we going to do it? To personal computers. Then the angle's going to have to be different. 
for here to make it it, it would have even. to be like that yeah yeah but it's not supposed to be even because no, this, this is one has to be. that has to be different. It has to but be. then it won't be the same angle it has to be like that we'll check that let me check it let me, oh, check, really it. Stupid. Let me check this where's number two the, we this go. Is the yellow one that one Believe me, that particular boy with the hat on no, is incredibly I learning that's disabled. That's very good. I think I got mine. There's a sort of Socratic method at work among the madness, a relentless challenge not just to do, but to understand. Why, no, why, why did that happen? Why does that work? Why did the others not work? The design lab is a field of dreams for fifth and sixth graders. Build a problem, they come with the answers. Maybe we should just try to, Sam. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Keep it going for a few minutes. Maybe we should just try to, Sam. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's just try to. Yeah. Let's see. Is this any other angle? Yeah, that's much bigger. I think it's much bigger. help you in any other classes? Mm, I don't know, not really. It helps a lot with problem solving and being able to being able to look at a problem and try and solve it from lots of different angles. And that, after all, is the whole idea. What we're really trying to do is give children an opportunity to solve problems using mediums other than symbols. They're doing more than that. They're generating pride, the kind of pride that comes when building blocks become stepping stones to ideas. Like if you're real good at the Legos, you can just automatically just make something up. You already know. You're the designer. Yeah. <laughs> at Graham and Park School, there's a lot more to building windmills than building windmills. David George, CNN, Future Watch. That the uh, uh, that the CNN people didn't uh, really emphasize. Um, kids go to at least two steps beyond this. Um, one, you write about what you're doing, and then you also go to and it was just mentioned briefly. You go to the computers, and using the logo program, you design what you just did with your hands. You try to replicate what you just built, and that takes it to another sort of abstract level, and it also takes it to the concept level, so that you start with your hands, but you end with the concept, and you end with the writing, and you end with the sort of deep thinking about what you do. The uh, next section is a uh, scene from an exhibition. It's an kindergarten exhibition. Um, again, some of you may know of the Coalition of Essential Schools, and one of the really important things that coalition schools try to do is 
have students come to a point in a project where they have developed something of really high quality. And they then can demonstrate that to other people. In this particular kindergarten class, we're going to see some science. Here again, our parents. The teacher has a science project in the year where each child with his or her parent develops a science project. They have to do it together. They then demonstrate it in the classroom individually, and then we have an exhibition where they demonstrate it to the rest of the school, to parents and other community people who want to come in. So we're going to see um, just a little bit of um, uh, this science. Uh, we're going to hear one child talking about his actual science experience experiment, and then you'll see some kids sort of messing with that science experiment um, in, the, in the library where we had the exhibition. Oops. Windmills. <laughs> David George. Uh, this was a much longer tape and I try to cut it down and you'll see some kind of messes up in the middle of it like that bird flying you do your science experiment on the bottle submarines and air pressure bottles in what bottle submarine a bottle submarine yes bottle submarines and air pressure and air pressure and how did you do that? Well, me and my dad got a jar and he put and he filled it with water. Then we got a film container and cut a hole in the bottom and put and took off the lid and, and uh, put and took off the lid and put a coil of wire inside. And then we put a toy robot. Then we put a robot eraser inside and put the lid back on the film canister and we caught a straw and we put rubber bands around the place where it bends when it, where it this bends. is a kindergarten and then we got a pair of tongs and we put film container in the water and we pulled out the lid to the jar wow that sounds like a lot of work did you have fun yes and the straw that yeah, and straw that we dad used with the rubber bands around the place where it bends it was was to stick up into the hole in the bottom and give it air. And the charm was to fish it back up to the surface to put air in it in case it got too much water in it. Wow. And you like doing it, huh? Great. This is his experiment, and there's a little kid who came with his mother, and he's messing with the experiment. He's doing the air pressure with it in the bottle. All that noise is all the other exhibitions are there, all the other experiments. Could you stop it now? Um, uh, there's really not a lot to add to that. Um, the, the kind of level of discourse that we um, uh, aim for in eighth grade, we really start in kindergarten so that you begin having kids think about things and be able to explain things. Um, I don't know if you were able to see in, that fi uh, in the film, it's not real clear, but uh, the child and the parent together wrote out and explained on a chart that experiment. Um, and uh, at the very beginning, uh, I tried to show the uh, booklets that were laid out on the table 
because uh, the, the children also wrote about their experiment and how they did it. Uh, not, only work, not only working from the chart, but uh, writing in their own way, uh, drawing pictures. You know, a, as you know, in kindergarten, one of the really, in first and second grade, one of the really powerful things that happens is that uh, children write stories, uh, and they write them in their own words, in, the, in, in their own in a sense, uh, and they draw pictures, uh, uh, and, and we make books that way. And we do, uh, at, at the lower grade levels, we do uh, uh, the documentation in a sense in that way. Um, next uh, uh, is going to be a really quick clip. Uh, uh, that second uh, overhead that I showed you of that classroom, uh, this is a video of that classroom, and it's just, uh, again, to get a sense of uh, how an open classroom functions. Um, I also might add that in curriculum, what we try to do, oh, by the way, we, we, we have no standardized curriculum in the school, uh, just like in your school. Uh, the power of the curriculum is in the teachers developing the curriculum. Um, uh, it becomes real because it's real for the teachers, it's theirs. Um, uh, and it grows also out of the needs of the kids. Um, what we try to do is to uh, do integrated curriculum so that if you're studying, for example, oh, I don't know, uh, big and small, uh, you know, you uh, read about uh, big people, uh, you read about little people, giants, dwarfs, uh, and, and by the way, those stories are in just about every culture there is in the world, so you can find stories about that. Uh, you, you do your measurement unit with big and small. Uh, you do your artwork. You know, kids make little bugs. They make big whales. Uh, they measure those. Uh, they think about water displacement. Uh, uh, you do your artwork around that. Uh, you, you try to get kids to write poetry, uh, write stories. Um, uh, you're reading uh, uh, incredibly in all kinds of areas around just that theme. And most of the teachers develop their curriculum around about month-long curriculum units. At least half, if not more, come out of the suggestions of the kids. We ask them what they want to study, whether they want to learn about. They also come out of the parents. At our first parent back to school night, uh, we asked parents what they would like to have their kids learn about, and we try to incorporate those suggestions into the curriculum. So it changes every year. It changes. It's dynamic. Yet, we teach the things that we need to teach. We teach kids how to write. We teach kids how to read. We teach kids how to talk, how to think. But that can happen. It can happen. It doesn't have to come out of a textbook. We have no basal readers in the school. We have real books. We don't have math textbooks, except at the seventh and eighth grade level. But we do know what we're doing and what is expected at each grade level in terms of the basic skills. Because we have talked among the staff We've looked at state standards. We've looked at standards all around the country. We've looked at the NCTM uh, stuff for math. We know what's expected. It's then up to the teacher to develop the curriculum that incorporates those skills, the, those bodies of knowledge. So in this room, uh, you won't really get to see much, but there, what, what, the, what they were doing in this room was a um, underwater uh, uh, or water theme. So they were studying creatures underwater, reading about them, writing about them, making models of them, etc. So, uh, quick. <laughs> Classrooms don't have to be quiet. When kids are actively engaged, it gets sometimes noisy. Noise is okay, just as part, long as it's part of the learning. And just as long as it's not distracting. OK, 
Okay. Um, <clears throat> I want to jump back just a second to uh, the design lab. That particular teacher, uh, Dan Klemmer, uh, has been involved for uh, about 10 years with a, a company in Cambridge called uh, BBNN, Bolt, Baranek, and Newman. Uh, they're they're uh, a, a techie company. One of the things they do is have an educational group, and they do research. Uh, Dan has been working with them in developing curricula. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, uh, we developed a uh, new math program to teach angles uh, with the fifth and sixth graders. We use billiard tables. Just think about it. If you want to be a good billiard player, you've got to know angles, don't you? Um, and now we have it on a, uh, 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 in a computer program that uh, Dan and the people at BBNN developed. Uh, I think it's for sale. Um, Every one of my staff, every one, is involved in some sort of external group like that doing research projects. It's one of the nice things about being in a rich city in terms of people doing things. Um, we're, work we're working with Turk. You may have seen the new Turk math programs, Technical Education Research Center. Uh, University of Chicago and Turk are the only really two sanctioned uh, math program sanctioned by the uh, NCTM for meeting their standards. Well, Turk also does science. And uh, uh, just about every one of my teachers has, have, have been involved with what we, I guess, would call discovery science. Learning how to do science in your classroom that, one, the topic comes out of the kids, and two, it's really based on doing, active involvement. It's trying to replicate in some ways what scientists do as they research. Um, Turk has been able to provide us with people who, one, will sit with teachers as the les lesson is going on, will tape it, will then, after school, go over the tape with the teacher, see what was really strong in that lesson and what needed to be improved and or try to figure out how kids were learning or not learning. Once a month, the, that group of teachers gets together and they talk about their successes and their failures as a group of teachers. You want to talk about staff development? There's no better thing in the world than that kind of staff development where it's really real, that it's happening on site in the classroom. I mean, if you've been a teacher in most school systems and you're involved with staff development, what it usually means is that you go to workshops. And what it usually means is that you're bored to death with those workshops and you don't learn very many things that you can really bring back to your classroom the next day. They don't enhance you as a teacher, as a learner. What we try to do is to make the staff development occur within the school. As a matter of fact, one of the structures we have in the school is a staff developer, a full-time paid position person in the school whose responsibility is the curriculum. If you're going to have teachers developing their own curricula, they need help. You know, we use help externally, we do provide the help internally. That person will go into a classroom, will observe a teacher, will give feedback, We'll help develop materials. We'll bring in outside experts. Anything and everything that will help make that classroom work. It's just not only curriculum. It's relationships with kids. It's physically setting up the classroom. It's getting materials. That person also works with us with our teams. We've broken the school down into teams. K2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And teams meet together to talk about curriculum, to talk about kids. Uh, and uh, so the staff developer works with teams. She works with the whole school. What we try to do is over a period of one, two, three, whatever time it takes, 
is to examine each piece of, of our curriculum, K through eight. What are we doing? Is it successful? Do we need to change any of the pieces? Do we need to look outside and see what's happening in the larger world in other schools and other school districts? What we try to do is to constantly keep ourselves focused on what we're doing and what other people are doing so that we can keep ourselves honed uh, and keep ourselves sharp. And the staff developer is able to help us do that. Uh, this year, I added a second staff developer to the building, half time. She works with K through two, primarily on literacy. Uh, we're, we're using, we've done away with standardized testing in K through two. And we're looking at different kinds of ways of assessing kids, like using the Mari Clay stuff, you know, where you really read real books with kids and you figure out what, what, what levels they're reading at. We try to document the numbers of words that a child has, say, when he or she comes into kindergarten, where they are at the end of kindergarten, where they are at first grade, second grade. You do that in writing also. Ask kids to write. Ask them to dictate. So we're trying to develop some standardized methods other than testing to assess where kids are. Um, and this person is helping the K through two team do that. Uh, she also pulls out small groups for reading. Uh, she works with teachers as a model, uh, modeling uh, either uh, some reading uh, literacy activities, you know, whether it's the big books or whatever. Um, uh, staff development is an incredibly key component, I think, to a good school. And it has to, from my perspective, really occur within the school, within the classroom, by somebody who really knows the school and who knows the kids and who knows the parents. A principal can't do that. It's impossible. One, we don't have the time. Two, we probably don't have the information. And three, we're supervisors. We evaluate. You can't be a staff, staff developer and be evaluative. You have to be a support person, an evaluator then. You, you, you always have a wall. You really can't have a trusting relationship uh, as, uh, and be a supervisor. OK. Um, this next piece is from Turk. Uh, and uh, it's a project that we've been doing for a number of years now called Cheche Conan. Um, and that explained in, in, in the tape. Uh, it's bits and pieces of a much longer tape, and I try to try to pull out the essence of uh, 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 what's happening with our bilingual students and, uh, 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 and the learning that they do. Uh, the children are speaking Creole, a form of French. In Cambridge, Massachusetts, teachers and researchers have been developing a model of collaborative inquiry in science for language minority students. Okay. The project is called Cheche Kone, which means search for knowledge in Haitian Creole. Analyses, collect and analyze data, build theories, and draw conclusions based on their research. Investigations are interdisciplinary. Students use mathematics okay. and language Nine. as tools for scientific inquiry. Can you describe the clouds to me? Can you tell me what happened? Most of the students had not studied science before, and many were just beginning to read and write. As a matter of fact, some of them have an animistic view of the world. And multilingual ESL classes. 
In these classes, students investigated questions on water quality, human physiology, and weather. Kids have become really very... Students ask and answer real questions that they themselves pose. One 7th and 8th grade class of Haitian students explored their questions about the effects of salt consumption on health. The students were motivated to conduct this study because members of their families and one or two of the students themselves had high blood pressure and were on salt-restricted diets. To investigate their question, they designed a series of experiments to explore the relationships among salt, weight, blood pressure, and pulse. For example, one of their hypotheses was that people who eat a lot of salt are out of shape. We're seeing how many times a person's heart beats in one minute. Next, we're going to make him run down the stairs and back up again to see if there is a difference in his pulse and his blood pressure before he runs and after he runs. When a person has run the stairs and has a high number for his pulse, we'll find out if he eats a lot of salt to see if people who eat more salt get tired more easily. They began to appropriate scientific ways of thinking, talking, and acting. I felt like there were some moments in the class. Before this, this teacher was incredibly afraid to teach and, science. Um, taking over for their own knowledge. For example, I get the one time. Uh, Students learned to cast their questions in quantitative terms and to use numbers to support their scientific reasoning. Okay, no, no, it's not 50. 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 Okay. At the Graham and Parks Alternative Public School, two kindergartens, one bilingual, one mainstream, collaborated on a year-long study of their local weather. In the process, they demonstrated the power of authentic scientific inquiry to promote mathematical reasoning. Okay. Remember that goes with 21? No, so what do you do with 21? Um, about the only comment that I uh, want to add to that, I've got 10 minutes left. Okay, I'm going to move along fast. Um, only other comment, um, that 7th and 8th grade class now is no longer taught separately. It's completely integrated with the monolingual classroom. In other words, kids who are just in from Haiti are integrated with English-speaking children immediately in science. And the level of science is not expected to be any lower than if it were just monolingual students alone. So we have to learn and had to learn how to do that. And it's not an easy thing, but I think we're achieving it. We're still experimenting. We're still trying to figure out how successful, how non-successful we are and what kind of support that the bilingual children need to be able to work at that kind of level, both in terms of language and in terms of concepts and ideas. As I said, some of the kids come from Haiti and have, a, have an animistic view of the world. Uh, in other words, that things are in here, uh, uh, spirits in here in things, and that's what make things work. And you take from that culture and you come to a scientifically oriented culture, that's a shock. And the change in these kids is incredible. Uh, the next piece um, uh, is a real quick piece, and it just shows uh, a teacher team working together. Uh, this particular team is 7th and 8th grade. They meet for extended periods twice a week, and they meet every day once a week. I mean, sorry, they meet every day in the morning. in 
the classrooms. They decide on the program structure. They decide on schedules. Whatever is connected with the program, the staff meet and work it out among themselves. The result from a teacher's point of view. It's the distinction between being having teaching as your job and having teaching as your career. And having it as a career is respected here. Teacher salaries have crept up across the country in the last few years. But it will take more than good wages to find and keep good teachers. Okay. Uh, just one comment about that. Uh, it was a 7th and 8th grade team meeting. Um, I'm not sure what they were talking about. I can't remember. Uh, it was a number of years ago. Uh, one of the people sitting there was the staff developer. Um, she's sitting there to help facilitate the meeting, but she's also there to help in terms of decision making uh, about the program. Um, I meet with the team when they ask me to. I try to check in as much as I can with them, but they do have the responsibility for the 7th and 8th grade program. Uh, they make all the decisions, and uh, to this point they've made all of the right decisions. Um, but again, it's not alone. Uh, once a month, uh, they meet with an advisory group of 7th and 8th grade parents, and uh, they talk about curriculum, uh, they talk about programmatic needs. Um, you know, we formalize a number of things through that kind of structure. Uh, uh, we do formalized mediation training. Uh, students have been trained as mediators. Um, uh, we have community meetings uh, once a week where uh, all the 7th and 8th graders come together and talk about uh, issues within the, uh, with, within the program. Um, uh, so we've tried to involve students and staff and parents in, in decision making uh, uh, about the program. Uh, one last bit uh, from uh, uh, a Christian Science Monitor uh, TV uh, program that was done on parent involvement in our school. Uh, Christian Science Monitor TV is dead now as a station, but uh, it's a, it was a nice little piece that they did. It's a 10 minute walk from the Fillmore's house in Cambridge, Massachusetts to the children's school. Bobby and Ray's classmates often tag along. They know Bob well because he takes an active part in activities at the school. Uh, this is rare. About 70% of the kids are bused across the city. The school was founded in 1972 as part of the Cambridge public school system under pressure from parents who thought traditional schools didn't give them enough say in their children's education. Open it, Bob. Open it? Yeah, open it. Is this your work? Five days a week, Bob Fillmore helps out for an hour in his son Ray's kindergarten class. Fillmore says the more he goes into the classroom, the more he's able to help his own children with their studies. If I'm going to learn about my kids and what they learn in school and uh, what they teach and everything, uh, uh, I should go to school with them and just, just you know, learn with them and see what can I learn and what can I do to help. Other parents help with reading or math. Some teach woodwork. The people who work at Graham and Parks say that the parents' presence benefits everyone. They've been enormous resources in terms of their personal skills and um, experiences to the school. Uh, it helps no, us another position we have in the school is a full-time paid parent coordinator. If you want parents in your school, you need to support them just the way you support staff. Um, it's very helpful and supportive to the staff at the school. Um, parents support one another. It's wonderful for the children. There are 380 students at Graham and Parks, half of them from minority families. About 60% of the parents help out in the school. Involved parents are always welcome here, according to the school principal, Len Solo. 
we can have uh, uh, more direct instruction to children uh, and breaking the class down into smaller groups and therefore getting more di more direct and I think better instruction to uh, children. Um, at another level, uh, we have parents involved in a lot of our decision making uh, within the school. Uh, they're involved with policy making on our steering committee or uh, with hiring on our uh, on our hiring committee. Uh, and so that we, we use the intelligence of parents to help us to make decisions. So really ease it. And then if it starts to get, if it starts to stay. Kate Bassler has taught both Bob Fillmore's sons in her kindergarten class. Bassler says she likes the idea of parents getting involved in what other schools often see as the teacher's territory. When parents come in the classroom, they get a much better picture of what really goes on in the school and are encouraged. They know the curriculum. Um, they're encouraged, perhaps, to become more involved in the school in a bigger way. The more we get together, 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 the more we get together, the happier we'll be. Teachers at Graham and Parks say parents don't need to come into the classroom to become involved. Some parents raise funds outside. Last year, they raised about $25,000. When the school lost funding for music last year, parents stepped in as music teachers. Parental involvement has its problems, too. There are some areas that the staff feel that parents don't have a right to uh, be involved in. Uh, specifically uh, in uh, evaluation of staff. Uh, they feel that that's an area that should be left to me and other administrators and should not involve parents. We had parents involved in, in evaluating staff for about 10 years. Bob Fillmore says that his job as a recreation supervisor keeps him busy enough and he isn't seeking more responsibilities at the school. He feels lucky that his work gives him some... Bob goes to, goes to work at 10 o'clock so he can come into the school from 8.30 till 10. ...is a clinical social worker. She says she hasn't time to go into the classroom. But at home, she helps her children with their studies whenever she can. She says that her own involvement and her husband's have benefited their children. I think the children appreciate it. I think it helps them with their identity. I think it makes the kids feel more integrated as people to see their family able to interface with the community and to be involved. How do you feel about having your dad in? Why? Bob Fillmore says he goes into the classroom for everybody's children, not just his own. He says it's worth putting in all the unpaid hours at the school. He says his reward is seeing the joy on the children's faces as he passes his skills on to them. Okay. Um, Bob is now a member of our steering committee. Um, he ran for election and uh, he uh, made it. Daria, just uh, one other quick thing. Um, uh, we, one other thing that we really do, I think, and we do well, is involve the community. Um, here's some of the ways that we do it. Um, at Harvard, uh, uh, we've tied into their, uh, uh, to the Kennedy School of Government. Uh, they've employed a person there to help recruit students for us. Isn't that pretty neat? They employed a person to help recruit university people to come to our school. We get about 50 graduate students each year each giving at least two hours of time to the school. Um, we are assigned a Harvard undergraduate house, and they come work with us, uh, tutoring students, being big brothers, big sisters, and working in our uh, homework centers after school. Uh, we're especially concerned about the Haitian students because there's nobody at home to help them since all of their parents are illiterate and a few speak English. Uh, we have to do homework in school, and so we, uh, we use outside people to do that. Um, we have a business partnership with Lotus Corporation. Um, they've provided us with uh, computers. Uh, they print our creative magazine each year, and it's an incredibly wonderful creative magazine that's put together by a group of parents, students, and staff. Um, 
uh, they lent us the, um, uh, a psychologist from their human resources department when we were having some difficulty on some really hard issues in the staff. Uh, they lent that person to us for a year so that we could work through the difficulties within the staff. Um, we've utilized foundations, uh, private foundations in the community to uh, write grants uh, for various programs in the school. We have a professional development relationship with UMass uh, Boston, um, and it involves such things now as full-time uh, interns. We have on-site courses for the students, taught, co-taught by my staff and the UMass staff. Uh, we help UMass uh, reorganize all of their courses that pertain to uh, teacher education, and many of the classes are co-taught by my staff and their staff. We have seen the quality of student teachers rise significantly in the last couple of years because of the professional development relationship. Um, we, as I mentioned earlier, are involved with a number of consulting agencies uh, in the Cambridge area, BBNN, Turk, um, uh, Education Development Center. Uh, we have foster grandparents in the school. That's a federally funded program that brings uh, retired people into uh, public places. So we have foster grandparents in the classrooms. Uh, they sit and read with kids, they cook, and they do various things. It's really nice to have that sort of intergenerational uh, connection. Actually, we also have another program called uh, in, um, Intergenerational Reading Program, where we've trained retired adults to work one-on-one -on -one with students in terms of reading. We've tried to bring as much richness into the school as we possibly can uh, because it certainly adds to the learning of the staff and it adds to the learning of the students. Um, I, I guess over in time, I was hoping we would have some time for questions and answers. I didn't realize I was going to go so long. We have some time? Okay. know where a staff developer comes from? Ah, good question. Um, the one that I had the longest, and she's still there as a matter of fact on a part-time basis, although she now runs the uh, math program for the whole city at the elementary level. Um, her background was uh, an open education teacher in a school in New York City. She then moved to uh, being a team leader uh, she moved to running workshops for uh, some other people in New York City. Uh, she happened to be moving to the uh, Cambridge area, and we snatched her. Um, the latest one that we hired, interestingly, was a former teacher from my building um, who had uh, uh, left because she uh, wanted to have a family. Uh, her kids now are all in school. Um, she's been working part-time at a local university teaching uh, ed courses and supervising students. Um, and we felt that she was really perfect for the position. Um, Cambridge has gone through various cycles of staff developers, uh, all the way from having central office staff developers who are specialized in certain areas, science, math, reading, uh, to having site-based uh, staff developers. There have only been a few site-based staff developers, and it's in the schools that insist on it. And it's usually the uh, developmental schools. Um, developmental education, the kind of school that I have, is the biggest draw in Cambridge. Uh, we started in 72. In 1975, we got 150 applications for 30 kindergarten slots. Well, we got those 120 people together and said, why don't you guys form a school? and uh, we helped them to go to the school committee. They lobbied and we established the school within the school, the King Open School. That population now is larger than the King School um, and it really needs its own building now. Uh, about four years ago, a bunch of parents in the neighborhood, since this is a citywide school, didn't get into our school. They were really pissed, uh, especially one of the people because she was a school committee member. Um, and so uh, we got them together and they set up another school, the Cambridgeport School. Uh, we helped the um, follow-through program become a developmental program. Uh, there were a group of pa parents in North Cambridge who uh, wanted to have a developmental school closer to home 
and we help them to organize uh, a, a school within a school at the Tobin School. Uh, now, the open schools are absolutely the most effective schools in Cambridge, and they're the ones who draw the, the most people. Uh, the school committee is a bit lax. Uh, uh, they still need to move on to more developmental schools because we can't accommodate everybody who wants their kids in schools like this. In your double grades, yes. do the, does the same teacher stay with the children two years in a row? That's the power. Yes, okay. absolutely. Uh, I, and that's the power, by the way, of a, uh, of a two-year classroom that the kid stays with the teacher for two years. We tried three and four and even five. Uh, that, that gets really hard, uh, especially at the lower grade levels. Uh, and we settled on, we also used to um, uh, reconfigure every year. Uh, we don't do that anymore because it's easier to do. We gave up what was sort of better for the kids, but to get something that's better for the staff, and that is if they're, they're closer in grade levels, we can do more staff development and better sharing that way. How are the children assigned to those classes? <laughs> uh, heterogeneously? Yes. Uh, by kind of randomly? Or no. do you set them up? Whew. It takes us two months to establish our classrooms. We start with teachers putting, uh, the sending teachers, because you always have a, a half of your class there. The sending teachers to the next grade level put up what they think are mirror classrooms. In other words, try to match each room in terms of the backgrounds of the kids. Without having the teachers' names, we, do, we literally do this on a board with kids' names, uh, where they are in reading, math, and their social skills. Then we, we, we don't have names on the boards, teachers' names. Then we pull randomly out of the hat which teacher goes with which board. Then we have received from parents previously a sheet of paper that tells us about the child's strengths and weaknesses from their perspective plus a request for the classroom because they have also visited each of the three or four classrooms at that level. Now, if a parent doesn't get his or her choice, they can appeal to an appeal committee of staff and parents. And we usually grant about half of those appeals based on various factors. But they're absolutely heterogeneously grouped. Okay, so a, um, a five, six would not necessarily be more five than six, yeah, developmentally. Uh, oh, <laughs> in, in, in a five, okay. Okay, in a, in a five, six classroom, you will have kids who are working at uh, a second grade level, uh, especially the newly mainstream kids, and you'll have kids working at a middle high school level or above. Okay, and every classroom is like that. I, I wide heterogeneity uh, by design. Uh, for one thing, <laughs> it forces teachers into not teaching whole groups. Because <laughs> you can't. You can't. I mean, the structure is there that tells you you have to use cooperative groups and you have to l use individualized teaching and learning because you can't, as a group, do the whole group. And, you know, so it's a structure that's really important. I think we're going to take one more question. I'm not sure I heard you right, but I think you mentioned something about Harvard lending you a psychologist. No, it was Lotus. Lotus. Lotus Corporation. To deal with some staff problems, could you share uh, oh, sure. some types of problems the staff runs into? Uh, how about racism? There were some staff members who, who thought other staff members were racist in terms of their attitudes, in terms of the dealing with children. Uh, it wasn't true, but yet the attitude was there, and we had to work through that. And it's really hard to work through that with only yourself because you're in it and you really need somebody from outside who can have trust to lead that discussion. It took us a year. And we went on site to Lotus. Uh, they provided us with dinner. Um, and we, we had a comfortable meeting place and we worked through the issue.
Oh, by the way, um, I left uh, uh, a bunch of these, uh, a series of flyers. Uh,